Okay, and to pick up where we left off, this is part two of chapter three. Now we're going to talk about basic brain structures and their functions. Early in life, overabundant connections form among the brain's neurons. Subsequently, life experiences help prune some of these connections to strengthen the rest. Much as pruning weak or non-productive branches on a tree to strengthen it. The brain's basic structures and their functions enable people to accomplish feats such as seeing, hearing, remembering, and interacting with others. The ability to study brain function has improved dramatically over the years. For most of human history, theorists and researchers have tried to understand how the brain works. Psychologists named Gall and Spurzheim proposed their theory of phrenology based on the idea that the brain operates through functional localization. If a person used a particular mental function more than other mental functions, the part of the brain where the emphasized function was performed would grow. This growth would produce a bump in the overlying skull. By carefully feeling the skull, one could describe the personality of the individual. This is a very debunked theory of psychology that happened in the 1800s. So lots of people are running around feeling people's skulls, telling them things about themselves. It's uh, basically pseudoscience at this point. Here's a diagram that they managed to put together back in that day of where they thought things were happening for the brain. And unfortunately, they were woefully wrong. But some parts of the brain can be specialized. Most of the brain can just be configured as it goes, but certain areas do do specific things. The first strong scientific evidence that brain regions perform specialized functions came from the work of 19th century physician and an anatomist, Paul Broca. He named an area after himself, Broca's area. It's a small portion of the left frontal region of the brain, crucial for the production of language. Paul Broca studied a patient's brain and identified the damaged area as crucial for speech production. This area shows the location of Broca's area. So basically there was damage to this area and the patient couldn't speak. So by the process of elimination, Broca was able to determine that this was an area of the brain that was involved in the production of speech. Now we're going to discuss psychophysiological assessment. Modern imaging techniques have greatly advanced our understanding of the human brain. This is done through psychophysiological assessment and polygraphs. A polygraph, also known as a lie detector, measures changes in bodily functions, for example, heart rate, perspiration rate, and blood pressure, related to behaviors or mental states. These changes are not reliable measures of lying but oftentimes it can be used to prove that. All right, and the first psychophysiological assessment we'll discuss is an EEG. You may have heard of an EEG before, but maybe you haven't heard of its elongated name, the electroencephalogram. This is a device that measures the electrical activity of the brain. This measurement is useful because different behavioral states produce different and predictable EEG patterns. They are too noisy or imprecise to isolate specific responses to particular stimuli. This has led to the discovery of event-related potentials, where they can see this action in the brain. Here's an example of an electroencephalogram. So you see the girl laying there in the, in the seat has all those wires coming out of something on her head. That's actually like a helmet that she's got on with all the wires connecting to it. And then on the computer screen, you can see the readout of everything. All right, and some other psychophysiological assessments are PET scans, MRIs, and fMRIs. 
A PET scan is a positron emission tomography. It is a method of brain imaging that assesses metabolic activity by using a radioactive substance injected into the bloodstream. An MRI is magnetic resonance imaging. This is a method of brain imaging that uses a powerful magnetic field to produce high quality images of the brain. And then there's the fMRI. It is a functional magnetic resonance imaging. It is an imaging technique used to examine changes in the activity of the working human brain by measuring changes in the blood's oxygen levels. Here's an example of a PET scan, a positron emission tomography. And it scans the brain's metabolic activity. So then on the right of that image, you'll see the red areas is where the activity is. Here's an example of an MRI and the high resolution image of the brain that it can produce. And in this case is an fMRI. This is the one that maps mental activity by assessing the blood's oxygen level in the brain. And the last psychophysiological assessment to talk about, and is one of the newer ones, is TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is the use of strong magnetics to briefly interrupt normal brain activity as a way to study brain regions. Here's an example of that in action. TMS can momentarily disrupt brain activity in a specific brain region. If you use this on somebody and you wave it around their head, you can actually make them move their muscles without their control. Sometimes people under this uh, brain imaging technique will move their arm wildly out of nowhere and then laugh because they didn't do it themselves. All right, and this concludes section two, chapter three.